Andy, my dude, have you heard of the magical website builder known as Squarespace? Ugh, not another Squarespace ad. I feel like every podcast is sponsored by them. <laughs> Hey, don't knock it till you try it. Yes, okay, it is overhyped. But actually, it lives up to the hype. Squarespace is like a website fairy godmother. With a click of a button, your site transforms into a beautiful masterpiece. A website fairy godmother? That sounds interesting. What makes it so magical? Well, for starters, those slick templates make anyone look like a professional web designer. Pick one, customize the colors and fonts to match your brand, and voila! Plus, the drag-and-drop fluid engine is so easy, your grandma could build a site on Squarespace. Well, she did knit me a lovely scarf last Christmas. Maybe website design is next. Exactly. And when you're ready to sell your Nana's handmade scarves online, Squarespace has built-in e-commerce. Add a store with one click, get flexible payment options, then watch those sales roll in. And when she wants to teach others her steezy scarf skills, Squarespace's new courses feature is just the ticket. Nana can set up her curriculum and enrollments and payments in a snap and become the next e-knitting influencer. Oh, wow, you really sold me with the grandma angle. Sign me up for that free try. Just go to the nextreel.com slash Squarespace and transform your site into a beautiful Squarespace masterpiece. Well, thanks, Pete. Even though it's overhyped, Squarespace actually sounds perfect for Nana's site's needs. Appreciate the warning on the ads, though. I'll brace myself next time I listen to a podcast. Anytime. Let me know if you need any help getting that site up and running. Andy, can you believe we've almost hit 700 episodes of The Next Reel? I know, it's crazy. And with all the other episodes in our family of podcasts, we are well over 1,200 episodes of movie conversation. It's really pretty amazing that we've gotten to have these in-depth movie chats every week for over a decade now. And we couldn't have done it without our loyal community of film fans. Their support over the years has meant so much. For sure. That reminds me, we should give the merch store a shout out. Buying shirts from thenextreel.com slash merch is a great way listeners can continue to support the show. Plus, they get to sport our great designs. Absolutely. I think sometimes folks forget we have a variety of shirts, mugs, phone cases, and more available. In fact, a great place to start is with a shirt sporting the Next Reel's logo. We also have that classic Fast Times Spicoli Surf School tee, or the weirdly popular Rusty's European Tour shirt. The one from National Lamp Foods European Vacation. Why is that so popular? <laughs> Search me, but we have sold a ridiculous number of those. I guess there are a lot of Rusties taking trips to Europe? We're always adding new designs based on movies we've covered, like our brand new design for a streetcar named Desire, featuring a streetcar named Desire. So if you want to rep your love of TNR and films, head to thenextreel.com slash merch. Every purchase helps us continue to have these weekly in-depth conversations. So visit thenextreel.com slash merch today. And as always, thanks for listening and being a part of the Next Real community. We've got lots more great movie chats coming your way. This is The Next Reel, everybody. I'm Pete Wright, and that there is Andy Nelson. Hey, hey, hey. And we spoil movies. Tonight on the show, it's the last of our Bergman series with both Ingrid and Ingmar in 1978's Autumn Sonata. You know, Pete, if this was purely a Bergman series with yeah. Ingmar and Ingrid, mm-hmm. it would be a very short series because this this would be it. This would be it. Yeah, this would be it. The one chance for them to work together. Did you hear how it happened? Did you come across that little tidbit of information? Why don't you tell me? I thought it was really kind of cute. So Ingrid was, and I can't remember what year, I want to say 1973 three or four, somewhere around there. Uh, she was on the like judging panel at the Con Film Festival. And Ingmar was also there. And apparently she just always had wanted to work with her namesake. She thought it would be real fun. She enjoyed Ingmar's films as fun as they are. <laughs> <laughs> it's a real hoot. He's a hoot. And uh, so she 
she had a note and she had written on it that she'd love to work with him. And she snuck it in his pocket. What? <laughs> in his coat pocket so at cute. the Cannes Film Festival. And he came across it later and uh, got in touch and said it would be great. And so then that was that. And next thing you know, well, I shouldn't say next thing you know, several years later, they finally uh, had the opportunity to work together. I This is one of those movies. Um, I had never seen it. I know you you had, yeah? I and had, your, yes. Your Ing- Ingmar uh, experience, I think, is is greater than mine. Yes. I, I'm guessing so. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I, I don't seek out a lot of Ingmar Bergman's film. I probably should. And watching this movie made me feel weirdly like, I should just watch more of these movies. <laughs> this one I found weirdly compelling. And it's not because of the film but because of the performances. I feel quite strongly about what uh, Liv Ullmann and Ingrid Bergman uh, were able to bring to this movie. I enjoyed the, the range and depth of, of them on screen. It also felt like an audiobook to me. This was Ingmar Bergman just crapping all over the old trope, show, don't tell. He just wanted to tell everything. If there was a character without their mouths moving, he wanted to fix that by having them say stuff. And usually the stuff was literally what was in their heads. What we, as the audience, I'll say we, meaning me, had already figured out because these performers are incredible and they can communicate so much with more than words. And yet he just had them talk and talk and talk. And so I enjoyed my experience with this movie in spite of many of what I felt were extravagant directorial choices and script choices from Bergman himself. Upon re-watching this film, I, uh, my, I, I've seen maybe half dozen of Bergman's films. Oh, and... your, your experience is significantly greater than mine. Good. <laughs> <laughs> Asked and answered. And I've seen largely the big ones, like The Seventh Seal, Wild Strawberries, Persona, uh, randomly, the magician is thrown in there. I wouldn't call that one of the big ones, but I have seen that one. Uh, Cries and Whispers is one I always feel like I've seen, but I don't think I actually have. I think the name just always sounds so familiar to me. Um, anyway, I think that's about my breakdown of what I've seen from Bergman. I uh, And I find his films to be very interesting in that kind of art sense of this is a a filmmaker who is using the medium because he has a very specific uh, mission with the way that he's going to tell his stories, whether it's a message or or not a message, but uh, a a theory, I guess, maybe a theorem about religion in a particular case, or this is going to be an exploration of family or things like that, or his own life. I feel like Bergman is one of those filmmakers who would often do that. And I think back in the era when he was really prominent, 50s, 60s, 70s, making these sorts of films, I think it, you know, the films that he was making along with other uh, foreign filmmakers really kind of created the type of film that Americans kind of classified as the you know, that foreign film where it was, I mean, that you would mock it all the time in, in movies where it was this black and white nonsensical scene happening of actors on a, on a screen, just, you know, doing something that didn't make any sense. I think that, that Bergman isn't quite there, but I, I mean, I think that there, he has a very specific thing that he's trying to explore with his films. It's not necessarily a Hollywood film. And and that's fine. I think that there is an audience for that. I have struggled with his films. I, I do fluctuate. There are some that I really find more effective than others. This one, I thought, I remember thinking when I first watched it, it was a pretty interesting movie about kind of a character exploration of the of these women in this family, this mother and daughter specifically. Upon rewatching it, I kind of really found that I I still don't like it all that much. Like I <laughs> I I get it and I see what he's doing, but I still find it really compelling. And it's the performances, and actually I I like the way that he structures it. It's actually like watching 
a uh, like going to a, an, a Henrik Ibsen play mm-hmm. and watching like you know you know what's it like the Glass House or you no know, a Doll's House uh, something like that. I, and I felt like this is very much in that style. The way that he structures it, everything about it felt so theatrical to me. Theatrical meaning it feels like it's of the stage. And and I'm fine with that because I feel like that's very specifically what Bergman was going for. And in context of what he's trying to achieve here, I feel like he's actually achieving it. I don't necessarily always like to watch films that just feel like kind of there's a lot of stage play elements to it, but I still found it very compelling. Do you, uh, when when I talk about the the, you know, tell don't show thing, does that hit you like as as a rational exploration because it just it it hit me so hard that this is what he was doing that it felt like he missed the point of making a movie in in, in, at times you know to a certain extent i mean it's it's a character piece so i i can't fault him for having a character piece where i mean it it is a play it's it's very much two characters largely having a great big argument is kind of what we're watching yeah. for yeah well a I mean, fairly it opens hefty chunk of it as a play right it opens at with oh, her very much sitting so, yeah. and writing a letter and we hear the voiceover of her husband and then the camera pulls back and i thought this was really clever the camera pulls back and he's standing behind the door and he's actually been narrating all along uh, right. I, I thought okay is this what i'm in for this i had no idea what i was in for when i turned this movie on and, and i found myself i'm not not kidding getting very excited i thought there he is going to do something really interesting if he is going to be breaking the fourth wall like this from the outset what a fun and clever way to make this movie and he didn't commit to that he, he didn't commit to that at, at all uh, and i'm disappointed by that however we do get some really interesting sort of slice of life scenes uh that demonstrate almost mechanically uh, by by pairing characters off, uh, you know, all of these relationships and how they they relate to one another. And we get to to sort of unravel the knot that is this family, the superficialness of the family and of the mother and daughter's relationships. And uh, until we get to this explosive sequence of, uh, you know, of them in their midnight um explorations of rage that I thought was, I mean, I was riveted. I was absolutely riveted. I really enjoyed um, the experience of of spending time with these two women on on screen. Uh, I, I didn't like how we got there. I felt like it was um, it, it was just so expository. It's case in point, uh, Ingrid is in bed. Uh, she is uh, having a conversation with herself about what to do with the car, and she tells the whole thing out loud. Like she says, "Maybe I'll no, yes, maybe I'll fly to Paris and and I'll buy a car, but I'll give the kids, I'll give my daughter my car." And she just outlines her entire plan as if she's talking to. Somebody. Of course, there's nobody there. That is a measure of inefficiency for me when I feel like that could have been handled in um, in another way uh, with other characters on the screen. Like, why do I have to just watch so many of, of these characters in these little monologue sequences that I felt were exhausting? Move it along. Well, and that's, I think, largely what I felt the first time I watched it. This time I ended up kind of going, okay, this is the what he's trying to do. He's he's going for these soliloquies. He's very purposefully kind of giving us and I, I would disagree with you a little bit, because I mean, yes, you get that really interesting moment at the beginning of the film where it's like, wow, this was an odd, it's a voiceover. Oh no, it's not. He's actually talking to us uh, you know, directly as a kind of a, a soliloquy where, you know, he's talking, breaking the fourth wall, talking to the audience. No one else, or, or you know, the only other person there, Eva, can't hear him. It was a very interesting way to kind of kick us off. Now, I would kind of say he keeps doing that. I mean, you said that it, he sets it up and then doesn't follow through. I think he does follow through because right out of the gate, he's doing something that is from the stage, and he continues to do stuff from the stage throughout the film. And I, I mean, I think that it's all right there. It's just it's if if you're going to click with it or not. And well, yeah, and I th- I'm speaking specifically about how they were using the husband. 
Um, yeah. But yeah, I wanted him to to jump back in and and move us through. Uh, sure, as long as sure. we have this kind of narrating character that we're we're opening with, it felt like it was that. That's what I'm talking about when I say it's non-committal. Uh, I get what you're saying. If you if you change perspective a little bit and just look at is this an exploration of things we do on stage? Uh, then yeah, I, absolutely. This is you're you're 100 right. It's a very theatrical film, and in that. Yeah. I, I I feel like it in doing so, Ingmar sacrifices the some of the beauty of the screen by being quite so committed to theatricality. I can't disagree with you too much, but at the same time, I guess this time, which again I find uh interesting that it actually ended up working for me. Uh, I think that's I really interesting, this time. actually. Yeah, yes. because if, if it's our history not my is anything, style. it is that you really can disagree with me too much, and you have in the past, <laughs> and I'm surprised <laughs> here. <laughs> well, it's because I, yeah, I don't know. I, I liked the way that it unfolded, and I actually liked the soliloquies. I liked the way that these characters explored the kind of themselves and explored kind of everything going on in their situation. I ended up uh finding it to be a, a compelling character exploration i don't uh again it's not something i love but i found the characters and i uh, to be interesting i i found the journey with them to be pretty interesting especially in context of this whole autumn sonata idea where it's kind of created like a sonata you know how it's it's structured with you know the if you uh, you know a sonata the way that it begins it's kind of these these little parts and the first part is kind of this slower build and then the second part is this much more intense part and then it ends on kind of a, a, a an easier part and it kind of works in context of the film the way that it kind of has that build and so it's an interesting I don't know. I, I guess I, I found it to be interesting this go around, more interesting than I did before. I'm I'm glad to hear it. And uh, again, because I expected this to just float straight to the bottom of of every list I could conceive of in terms of my appreciation of film, because I just I I felt like what I went in when I I press play, I thought, okay, here we go, and Shannon Delute, that's what I'm getting in ready for. It's going to be surrealist, oh, Bunuel and, and Dolly, and uh, I can't wait for it to be over. Uh, that that is not uh, that is not my experience with it. I quite enjoyed it. To your point about being structured by like a sonata, uh, the the piece that they play in the film Chopin's Prelude Number no. Two in A Minor, which I, uh, the the sequence that uh, where we have uh, uh, the daughter play the piece with her interpretation, and then the mother, um, you know, jumping in and playing the piece as a, a teacher and a professional, showing up the daughter is such a beautiful and uh, um, perfectly articulated experience of uh, mother-daughter trauma for me. And it is only exacerbated by the ugliness of that prelude, which is, uh, you know, I'll, I'll say subjectively, what I want to say is objectively terrible. Like it is one of the worst of Chopin's preludes. And I love Chopin's, but I love playing them. I love it. But this one is just it is a celebration of, I think, some grotesqueries in, in putting notes together and that they spend so much time uh, kind of celebrating the interpretation of it also highlights the beauty of that experience and uh, and the beauty of how hard it is for two people who are ostensibly so close uh, to, to find peace together after, you know, such a childhood of misunderstandings and miscommunications and abandonment. Uh, that is what very much what that prelude represents. And I think it is it's beautifully selected for the film. Well, and what I found interesting about it is that it's 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 really kind of the moment where where Eva recognizes that her mom, like the love that she never really felt from her mom through her childhood, this is where all of that mother motherly love is, right? Like all of mom's emotions are going toward this piece right now, which right. is such an ugly piece, like you said, like it's not a fun listen at all. But the way that Charlotta kind of puts her passion into one, describing it in the way that she kind of tells what it's all about, and then she plays it like very 
it, it fits exactly like with the way that she described it, right? Mm-hmm. It just, it fits perfectly. And it's just kind of this, this rough listen, but you can tell that she's putting a lot of her soul into it and, and making sure that it, it's what Chopin would have wanted, basically. I thought that was to be really interesting. And it's such a powerful scene because of the way that that Bergman shoots it, where you have uh, Lee Volman kind of staring. She it's, it's a beautiful two shot where mm-hmm. Lee Volman is kind of, we're, we're to the, uh, you know, we're on the um, uh, Ingrid Bergman's left. And we have her profile looking down at the piano. And Lee Volman is behind her looking toward her. So she's kind of almost staring into the camera. And we hold on this shot for quite a while as Charlotta plays the piano. And it's just this beautiful shot where you're you're watching Lee Volman's face as she's kind of just finding these feelings that and and this this seeing this this coming out of her mother that she kind of has never seen is it's just like i don't know i found it to be an incredibly effective moment in the film it was really beautifully done it's it's stunning i mean it's it is a stunning sequence I, no other way to put it um and and again it highlights the incredible depth of these performers that uh, ulman is able to pull so much out of that single experience sitting on the bench uh, watching her mother play, uh, such a credit to her uh, ability to demonstrate. And I think that is, I, I, that's it, Andy. I mean, that is the thing that I long for so many other areas of this film, so many other sequences where I feel like uh, uh, Ingmar has them talking when he should just let them do their stinking jobs. Uh, and I-, I wanted more of this this experience that I got with Ullman on the bench behind the music and less of Ingrid talking to herself about how she's going to how she's so great. And she's going to get a car in bed. That's that is in a nutshell what I had hoped for in this movie. They are exceptional performance. Yeah, I, it's one of those things. I, I found it to be really interesting this time. And I'm surprised because I really enjoyed those soliloquies and and I found them to be so illuminating of the characters. Now, again, it's because I'm kind of looking at it like it's kind of like a play and, and watching her do these soliloquies. It's very much what an actress would sure. do on stage as they're doing it. So I, I don't know. It's just it's something I ended up clicking more with this time. And I question like what would what would we see more of? And I don't know the answer to that. If if we weren't seeing that kind of stagey talking, what would what would we be seeing? I I feel like so much of this, and and again, this is me speaking with uh, limited experience with Ingmar Bergman, uh, and uh, my experience with him is that when he has this is uh, um, to your point, correct my language. When he has a theme that he wants to expound upon, when he has an idea that he wants, he's a blunt instrument. Right. That, that's my experience. And uh, in, uh, you know, the what was the seventh, the seventh seal? Yeah, uh, that's that's, you know, a blunt instrument of uh, of ideas. <laughs> you know, it's a it, whatever you think of it. It is a blunt instrument of ideas. This is in, in the same regard. This is a blunt instrument of ideas of relationships and pain and death and fear of of loss. Uh, and what all of those anxieties do to relationships, but it's uh, you know those those soliloquies are all part and partial to the blunt instrument of experience that I have with the film. Um, and and again, I liked it. Like I expected to not like it, but I liked it as a result of the parts and not so much as the sum. Um, can can we talk a little bit about your uh, about the the Bergmanness? of it like are you able to make some comparisons uh between this film and some of the other films and his strategies for for building the film based on your experience with him because what i have read is uh in the the critical reviews that this film has a gentler touch with some of his you know otherwise you know it, it's a quieter film it's his golden pond <laughs> the loons the loons norman <laughs> I don't know. I, I don't know how well I can expound on all that, but I can. I can try a little bit. Um, 
I, I will say this film came at a point in his career when he things were rough for him. He had kind of uh, fallen out of favor a little bit. Some of his films weren't being received quite as well. He had this large tax scandal that had happened in Sweden where they came to arrest him when he was directing a play and all this stuff because they said he owed taxes on, on uh, some films that he had done. And it was this huge embarrassment for him. And later, I mean, the Swedish government had to come and apologize because they were actually wrong um, with all of this nonsense. But what he ended up doing is he fled the country, basically. He went to, uh, I can't remember where he went to live. I want to say Germany and um, and made three films while he was uh, in exile. It was this kind of a voluntary exile. He made... Uh, the Serpent's Egg, he made this film, and he made From the Life of the Marionettes. They were three films between 77 and 1980 that he made in his exile. And, not, and from my understanding, neither of those other two were received well at all. And so he was just having a really, really rough time. This film is something that uh, I think because of Bergman's interest in working with him, uh, he was always trying to uh, write projects for Lee Volman. They had been a, a, a couple for quite a while. I think by this point, they had already separated, but he was still making projects for her. And, uh, he, you know, he explores a lot of family issues, um, issues with his own mother, issues with, uh, I think he had a brother who had some uh, some sort of uh, illness that kind of kept him, I don't know if it was as bedridden as the character of Helena that we have here in this film, but uh, it sounded like his brother had some issues like that. His father was a pastor, so he is talking about religion quite often in his films. And I think there was a lot of just, you know, stuff for him to explore. I don't know if this is, I, I can't speak to the fact that this one is necessarily softer than some of his other films. Um, uh, I feel like maybe not so Wild Strawberries, which for me, at least in my recollection, it's, that's the one I probably saw first and and haven't seen since. It always struck me as a very soft, kind of touching, poignant film. But um, maybe my recollection of it is incorrect. But I don't know. Did you find something else about kind of why this one is viewed that way? No, I, I, honestly, I did not. And, and I can't really comment on it because I haven't explored so much Bergman. But I, I have to tell you, like, based on the gap between my expectation and my experience is wide with this film. And it, it piques my curiosity for others. I, I feel like I've, I've been doing the the director short shrift and and yeah. should probably correct that. Well, I mean, he certainly is a director that's worth watching, but you just have to be kind of be ready for it because they aren't just films designed for entertainment. They are films to watch as like a a a, a complex painting to study. You know, it's he is saying something and he wants to kind of talk about it and you're there to kind of explore it and think about what he's saying. I uh, sometimes just am not in the mood for that, but I can't argue the fact that he's making some really interesting projects. Yeah. Um, this film, I I don't know. I, I feel like what I find most interesting about this one is just the emotional complexities that we have with the mother and daughter and the way that the relationship, uh, the way that they kind of push each other and pull back and kind of there's this push and pull through the bulk of it up until we get to that big, uh, you know, fight three quarters of the way through that really kind of all gloves are off and they're just saying some, some awful stuff to each other before we kind of are, you know, pull back and, and hit that, uh, that last, uh, bit that slows down the pace a little bit. Mm -hmm. It's, it's a really interesting th film. And I think Ingrid Bergman, she actually had kind of a tough time dealing with the way that Ingmar wanted to make the film. And she didn't, didn't like having so many close ups. And she, when she looked at the script, she's like, we're not really going to be talking this much, are we? So I think she's very much in your camp as far as that goes. <laughs> Because she's very much like, you know, we need to cut some of this out. And I, you know, uh, I think in their first reading of it, Ingmar was like, you know, 
horrified and was and went to Lee Volman and was like, oh my God, did I is is the script really this bad? And and she's just like, no, you two just don't know how to you haven't found the words to use with each other yet to find to find a way through this. And eventually they did, but apparently there was quite a bit of fighting initially with uh, getting this film going between the two of them because they just kind of had different ways of going about things. And it took some time, but it ended up, uh, I think it came together. And honestly, I really think that Ingrid Bergman, she's incredible in this film. I mean, it's a very difficult performance. Both of the women here have, I mean, just very difficult performances, a lot of emotion, a lot of raw energy that they have to put on screen. Um, yeah. I, I, and to that end, that's why I think it's funny that somebody would say they view this one as one of the softer films because I'm like, this is a pretty raw, difficult film. Well, yeah, that this that whole third act, you know, fight the the midnight fight is um, it it is as as raw and sort of unplugged as they come. And uh, I, I would say, you know, I I, I want to add to that the not just these two women going at it and talking about their history together but the when he starts intercutting um you know uh, Helena throwing herself out of bed and crawling to the stairs and the uh, the patience with which he he and he draws out her journey across the floor uh, as she drags herself there uh, while these women are are going at it downstairs not able to hear her as she finally uh, you know Helena finally yells you know, mother come, you know, I mean, it's just, uh, it, it's just heartbreaking. I mean, it really is a, an incredible roller coaster and, uh, of, of this family. It, and, and then there are some bonkers sort of, I don't know, there's bonkers sort of assumptions that they end up getting away with. And the result of, of all of this, or I think buried in the, uh, in all of the emotion, like at, at some point they make the case that Helena's, um, uh congenital like degenerative uh health condition which i as far as i understand they didn't name uh is the result of charlotte taking her boyfriend yeah i i i don't know if they were saying that the disease was i mean i think that eva does kind of come out and say she's it's your fault that she's the way she is well yeah um, and she and charlotte says so you, are you saying that you think it's my fault that her disease is my fault and eva says yes and she says oh <laughs> like, like this is news to me okay well i need to really yeah. think about this yeah, it was one of those things. I don't, I don't think that the filmmaker is saying that that this actually caused the disease, um, but I do feel like he's saying that there was emotional um, trauma created because the daughter had kind of this crush on this boyfriend of mom's, and uh, when the boyfriend left. It, uh, it emotionally tormented the girl and it kind of broke her spirit, I guess. And that kind of, um, you know, I don't know, I guess maybe she gave her body to the disease and that was kind of how I interpreted it. I didn't think she was saying she the disease came from the fact that he left. Yeah, I think, A, that was unclear. I don't know that he was actually making a position but uh, one way or another, but I do, I, I did find myself thinking, I don't think they would say that. Uh, I don't think they would attempt to make that connection. Uh, and I found myself like curious why there is already enough baggage between this mother and daughter. Like, why do we need this one? Like it, it was a, a little bit of a, a you know, a, a relentless slog toward uh, an emotional, like just emotional turbulence. And, and I, uh, so for me, it was, it was a little much. Well, it's one of those, it is one of those things where it's like, they keep amping up, you know, the, the, the steps toward each other toward, you know, with all the pain and torment and everything, you know, uh, Eva reveals, you know, things to mom, and then mom reveals, you know, you know, this thing, and that thing, and they kind of keep going, going back and forth, you made me have the abortion, and it was the best thing and all this sort of stuff. And, and it, it felt like they were amping it up one last step. It's almost like what, uh, you know, um, 
who's afraid of Virginia Woolf, mm-hmm. you know, finding out what happens at the end of that, but then they keep going. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. Like, well, you also did this. Well, you also did this. Yeah, you know, it's it's almost. I yeah, it it, it feels like there there is this level of one up one upping each other yeah. that uh, you know it it maybe they went. A step too one far step, with that last one. One but, step too far. They were already yeah. there. And in fact, I think they already had enough baggage. It, it felt to me like they were trying to find a way to use Helena and her disease in the narrative. And it felt shoehorned in at the last minute because we already knew that Helena was abandoned by her mother in this home. We already knew that. And you know what else? That's enough. That is enough of a family travesty that we don't need to add this boiled, ginned up relationship swap uh, to make that work. We just don't. We're already heart sick. Come on, man. Where it's it takes me I was in it and then I'm back out of it and that's that is my criticism here that sure. that that it was a bridge too far. Yeah, and it's especially because it's such an interesting substitute and kind of a in a way I don't want to say disturbing I don't think that's the right word but it's it's Helena becomes almost like a surrogate child for Eva to take care of. And we find out Eva lost her four-year-old son in a drowning accident. Mm -hmm. And then she decided to take Helena in and takes care of her. And it almost becomes this substitute child. And so she's almost like more than just the daughter now. You know, now she's kind of doing the job of mother that her mother never did. And so, yeah, there's there's such interesting things to psychologically explore anyway in there and to have that and especially the abortion, which I felt like I could have used even a little more of that because I felt like there was a really interesting story going on with what happened with Eva and this doctor. And I I don't know, it it sounded like there was a really interesting thing. And we certainly get some of it, but uh, and it certainly bothers her husband when he kind of hears it and leaves. But I, yeah, I, I really kind of felt like let's explore that. And I, you know, I'm, I'm kind of coming over to your side, I think a little more, <laughs> this whole thing with, with, um, was it Leopoldo, um, or Leonardo? Leonardo, I mean, Leonardo. Yeah, yeah. And his, and this whole kind of thing that Helena has this crush on him. And it, I, I again, I don't think they're saying that, that him leaving is the cause of her disease. Or not the cause, but it just made her made her worse. But I think that it's something with her spirit that that went. But you're right. I don't think it's as strong as some of the other things they could have done in their exploration. And um, well, and yeah, it's, it's it's all it about like it tougher. This- intrinsic versus extrinsic to the to the the character narrative right i mean everything that we're exploring with them is their their internal sort of response to one another and their actions and as soon as we get to oh by the way there is this weird coincidence about this boyfriend uh that becomes an external motivator and those things collide it's not that external motivators are bad, not that internal motivators are bad. It's that when you are so invested moving in one direction, uh, you we're going through this introspective thought experience between mother and daughter, and then you give us a, essentially a, a, a an action movie trope, right? I mean, this is the, this is the the relationship breakup uh, scene prior to the the big event. Um, I. I feel like that that stopped the momentum uh, for me. And I, and I think this film is is at its best when it's in service of momentum. It also, you know, we get these interesting blends. And this is something I think Bergman does uh, sometimes effectively, sometimes not very effectively throughout the film is the way that the editing works. In this film, there are some scenes that are just jarringly cut together where you just you're in the middle of a scene and then all of a sudden you're out of it. And all of a sudden you're in a totally different environment. There's no lead in or lead out with some of these scenes. It's just you you just cut hard from a scene like and I can't remember what scene it cuts from, but I feel like it's when we cut to Charlotta in her room and doing one of her soliloquies. But it was like right after dinner or something. Yeah. And all of a sudden, boom, we're just in the room with her. I'm like, oh, there was no wrap up to that dinner scene. It's just we're here all of a sudden. Same thing with the end of this scene. Like it's it's interesting how we kind of pair the shots of uh, Charlotta as she's saying, "Help me, help me," 
with the shots of uh, Helena as she's kind of crawling on the floor and saying, Mama, come, Mama, come. There's a really interesting pairing there, but at the same time, but then we cut. We it's a hard cut out of that to like the next day, and all and all of a sudden, like that's the end of this movement of the sonata, and now we're moving into the final movement. We have Eva sitting at her desk in a shot very reminiscent of the first uh, of the first scene in the movie, and it kind of we kind of go through the motions of the voiceover and everything. And we learn that, you know, Charlotta, the mother has left and, and we kind of, we kind of go through all that, but it, it, it's, I don't know. And I don't know. I, I, again, I don't, I haven't seen enough of Ingrid Ingmar Bergman's films to be able to say, this is something that he does, but the way that the editing works here, I do find jarring. And I feel like uh, there was something I could have used to kind of, lead me better out of this scene into the next scene i i agree with that i it, to to me i mean i i can't tell are you are you being critical of the mama come the way that sequence no, was no, edited no. or i i i think that was beautifully okay edited. good yeah that's I, uh, I that's think what so i'm too. saying is like the, it's this contrast of of like great editing paired with the way that the editing happens to take us out of that yes. scene into the next yeah. scene it's like i felt like i you know we could use a better wrap up with that big climactic moment, especially that big climactic, because then we're just done. We're on a train and we're hanging out with Paul and yeah. then we're in the graveyard and it's just we're all over the place. And I, I think I, I think you're right. I, I agree with that. Um, yeah. OK, we should we should, uh, of course, mention the cinematography, though, by Sven Nickvist. Uh, this is. I boy, I, I feel like they had worked together probably at least a dozen times, maybe before before we get around to this movie. Um, uh, this is called Autumn Sonata, and it felt like Sven heard that and said, "Reds and oranges, yep. here we go." <laughs> <laughs> yes, and and you, you know, what I'd say, I'll give you autumn. I'm going to give you autumn. I'll give you autumn <laughs> right in here. Well, yeah. It's uh, but but again, I I actually uh, I liked it. I felt like I was weirdly as it, at at some in in some places it's quite extravagantly red and orange and and also I felt like I was being given a hug most of the way through the movie. Even when they're yelling at each other, it felt just sort of like I was I was embraced by the visuals. Yeah. No, and I'm I'm totally making fun of them. But yeah, I agree with you. It was just it was beautiful to look at. The color tone of this film is just so consistently beautiful throughout, even when it's the middle of the night and it's largely uh, you know, just shadows and and little lights here and there, uh, it still has that tone. It's just it's a beautifully colored film all the way through and it's just it, beautiful in its consistency which i think is is what makes it so great um especially when you have moments like that that scene when uh, when charlotta comes downstairs and she's in that bright red outfit which it just feels so not appropriate for some reason but it, it works especially well because of the color tone in the film. Yeah. All of a sudden, it's just like, oh, she's she's dressing for the film. It it worked really nicely. Yeah, yeah, great, great. Yeah. So uh, we talked a little bit about getting it made, but something that that we didn't mention, which I think is something that's a little important, the fact that uh, that Ingrid did really kind of connect with this story. Uh, you know, the fact that. It's this self-centered artist who leaves her children and has difficult, tumultuous relationships with them because of that. She kind of connected with that story. And it was another of the reasons that she ended up wanting to make this film, even though she found it difficult um, to kind of connect with um, as she was performing it and difficult with Ingmar and they they struggled with their relationship. It was a... it, But it really connected with her. And I mean, this is, we've talked about her story. You know, she left her family um, to go, um, you know, fool around with Roberto Rossellini and go uh, work on films with him in Italy for a while. And then that ended. And so she was kind of very much this self-centered artist pursuing her career. 
And so she really identified th- with that. And I, I think there was something, I don't know, I found this as the end of our Ingrid Bergman series to be a really interesting film to kind of come around to as this actress who has kind of lived a little bit of this character to, and then to kind of explore it with her. I think it was a really interesting uh, choice. Uh, plus, I mean, she had just been diagnosed with cancer right before filming this. And it was, uh, I think it just made for a very emotional time for for her. What did you think of Ingrid in the film? Uh, it, well, it was, she was fantastic. I mean, she really was just wonderful. And, uh, you know, it, I struggled to to figure out who she was at the beginning of the movie because, you know, it's Ingrid Bergman. Like, I wanted to like every bit of her. And yeah. and so and, and she makes that hard, appropriately hard in this movie because she's she's all over the place as the as the mom who has the bad back and has the career and is famous and struggles to relate to to her own family. Like you you start to un, unravel that, but she's she's portrayed so subtly um, that uh, you know I I found myself like tested constantly in my impression of her and and i thought that was a fun game uh you know having the my experience of her uh, really detesting her you know motivations to go um oh here's the scene that really set the sequence that really sets it apart for me her performance that that demonstrates how i felt tested around every corner uh we're getting we're cutting back and forth between her getting ready for dinner before she puts on the red dress and uh, the uh, family preparing for dinner downstairs. And the family is speaking in all this wonderful sort of um, uh, superlative language about how great it is that she's here, how wonderful they welcome her. And there's this one little dig that that the daughter gets in on, um, you know, just wait, just wait to see how she dresses for dinner. And see that she's not trying to make you realize that she's still the grieving, you know, whatever, grieving widow, whatever she is. Is that one little dig? But otherwise, it is on the surface, it is very positive. And Bergman is upstairs just flaming through her dressing ritual. Uh, like her inner soliloquy is all about how much she's she's trying to make a point, how much people don't understand her, how hard she has it and her back. And it's just, I mean, she's just burning the room up. And then she walks downstairs in that dress and it's all different. It's all washed away. They're back living on the surface again. And that turn between um between Ingrid upstairs getting ready and Ingrid downstairs beginning to enjoy dinner is why I I found myself like loving and hating Ingrid Bergman in this movie. I think she's just fantastic at making those nuanced little turns and having them exist in the same character. And see, that's why I think those soliloquies are so interesting, because the way that they play as these these, you know, it's not just subtext, but we're we're getting this inner glimpse of this character. And then we have that as the perspective so that when we have that conversation afterward at dinner, we are like living this. We are the living subtext of everything that they just kind of discussed with each other. And it's all out there in our heads, but none of it is out there. And it's like they know it and they're all, they're all dancing around it. I just, I found it to be really interesting to watch these characters interacting because of all of that. Now, I see what you did there, bringing it back around to me defending your point. And I just want to <laughs> say, all I want to say is I'm sure there are alternatives to doing the out loud talking soliloquy <laughs> thing. That's all I want on the table. <laughs> I will say, I couldn't well watch this. <laughs> Thanks for defending my point. Yeah, right. I I will say I couldn't watch this without chuckling to myself a little bit, thinking about um, the bad guy in um, uh, The Incredibles. You caught me monologuing again. Exactly. God, God, Charlotte, come down for dinner. I can't. I'm monologuing. That's what was going on upstairs. Uh, Okay, let's let's uh, wrap this up. What do you got? Yeah, I'm trying to think. uh, Sequels and remakes. uh, yeah, there were surprisingly uh, there were some. This is one of those films that I, you're not going to get a sequel to, but remakes certainly. <laughs> there was a Hindi film inspired by it called Tezib in 2003. In uh, 28, there was a a, uh, a version performed in Madrid called Sonata de Otoño. Uh, there was a stage adaptation in Stockholm. 
in 2009, also another theatrical adaptation in 2011 based on the screenplay done in Connecticut, and in 2017, an opera, which weirdly this seems perfect for opera. Uh, That was done in 2017 in uh, Sweden as well. So it certainly has had its share. And again, I feel like adapting this for stage makes a lot of sense because it feels very much like something you would see if you go watch an Ibsen play. It very much has that feel to it. So I totally see why so many of these um, these remakes or adaptations were basically for the stage. Oh, I would love to see this on stage. I would love to see that whole experience of of just being with uh, people who are so adept at channeling emotion at me in live theater. I would I would love to see this performed. It is so funny yeah. to me that it went this way and not the other way from stage to screen. Uh, yeah, right. It feels like something yeah. that would have started on stage. Yeah. How to do an award so. season. Uh, this was a, uh, you know, it was a film that probably Bergman was thrilled that uh, people were actually connecting with it, considering that he was having struggles, like I said, with his previous films getting much uh, recognition. I mean, people seemed to hate his previous one. This film had 10 wins and eight other nominations at the Academy Awards. Ingrid Bergman was nominated for Best Actress in a Leading Role. She lost to Jane Fonda for Coming Home, which is a great performance, really is. Uh, Also, um, Ingmar Bergman was nominated for Best Writing, Screenplay, written directly for the screen, but also lost to Coming Home. Over at the Golden Globes, it did win Best Foreign Film. And again, Bergman, Ingrid Bergman, lost Best Actress to Jane Fonda in Coming Home. But the film, I mean, it was well-received. You know, it won over at the uh, the uh, the Donatello Awards over in Italy. Ingrid and Liv Ullman won Best Foreign Actress. Uh, it also won Best Foreign Director over there. The National Board of Review, it won Best Director, Best Actress, Best Foreign Film, top foreign language film uh, you know it it a lot of people loved it they connected <laughs> with it and i think this is uh it, it helped bergman ingrid ingmar gosh i'm getting my bergmans confused it helped ingmar kind of a little bit start getting out of the funk so that he could get back to a place where uh you know he could start doing some of his later successes like fanny and alexander and I know that because uh, Ingmar had to bury his financials in the West German uh, financial tax evasion banks that you are directly piped into, that this is probably some of the best and most rigorous financial <laughs> data that you could possibly bring to us. Oh, surely. Surely. <laughs> No, yes, you just. Uh, unfortunately, this is one of those movies that, you know, just very little financial information is out there, unfortunately. I couldn't find anything about the budget anywhere. But considering it was made in Norway by a Swede and financed by U.S. and British companies, perhaps that comes as no surprise. What I did find was that the movie was released here in the States October 6th, 1978, opposite The Voice from Brazil, Days of Heaven, The Big Fix, Going South, and Midnight Express. All in all, a pretty busy weekend. The movie went on to make just under $2.9 million domestically, which is about $10.6 million in today's dollars. I couldn't find a lot about the international box office. Um, I had some information about some countries. It made about 1.3 million in the countries listed, which is about 4.9 million in today's dollars. That gives me a rough guesstimate, I guess that's the best I'll call it, of about 15.5 million in today's dollars as far as its gross. Not bad, but again, with no budget info, there's no way to say if it actually made any money or not. Well, Andy, all that said, this makes this the final movie in our, I'll say first, Ingrid Bergman series. Who knows what's next? Uh, but I I have... Uh, Ingrid. Uh, Ingrid. I feel really good about wrapping up the series uh, with a film like this, giving her a chance to really shine. Uh, and, the, and, you know, coming off of last week, she's actually in this movie. So. <laughs> right. Yeah, she didn't get a lot of murder or in the Orient Express. <laughs> yeah, it was really interesting to kind of look at her career and just kind of, I mean, we had some uh, a kind of a thick spell through the, the 40s. But really, I mean, I feel like there was just a nice swath of 
films for us to look at with Ingrid. And you can yeah. see why she became a star. She's just a beautiful actress with who's just really incredible um, on screen, just does a great job. And it was a thrill to kind of visit and revisit some of these films and check her out. And this, sadly, this was her last film. As I said, she found out she had cancer, which would take her life, um, I think, four years after this. Yeah. And she would only make, I think, one more project after this, which was for TV. It was a TV movie called, a or TV miniseries, excuse me, a woman called Golda about the late... Israeli Prime Minister Golda Meir. Well, Andy, on that note, I think it's time to rank it. Let's do it. Head over to flickchart.com slash the next reel. You'll see all of the movies that we've talked about on this very show. If you swipe over in the show notes, tap the word flick chart, it'll take you straight to this movie where you can add it to your list and see how it stacks up against ours. All right, first up, and remember, we've got a trio of Bergman films right in the middle of our chart. So we're going to run into a lot of Bergman... um, Bergman on Bergman on Bergman action. Especially starting out. This is Bergman on Bergman on Bergman. Autumn Sonata or Stromboli. Oh, Autumn Sonata. Autumn Sonata, please. Crying out loud. Autumn Sonata or Fargo. Oh, well, Fargo. Fargo. Autumn Sonata or Mother. Oh, you could call it mother or mother. <laughs> I'm going to go with mother. I am too. Autumn Sonata or thank you for smoking. Thank you for smoking. Thank you for smoking. Autumn Sonata or Viridiana. There's something that we haven't seen pop up in quite a while. Wow. Uh, I'll be Autumn Sonata on this one. <sighs> yeah, I think I will too. Autumn Sonata or The Departed. We'll take The Departed. The Departed, yeah. Autumn Sonata or The Thomas Crown Affair, 1968. Uh, I'm going with go. Thomas Crown Affair. Really? Yep. I'm going to go Autumn Sonata. Weird. Oof. Wow. A chill okay. enters the room. <laughs> All right, here we go. Yeah. One, One, two, two three. three. Paper. Scissors. Okay, that's fine. That's good. I said my piece. All right. There you go. Autumn Sonata or High Noon? High Noon. Ah, boy. I liked High Noon less than I used to, but I'll still go with High Noon. Autumn Sonata or Creep Show? Absolutely Creep Show. (laughs) Okay, Creep Show. (laughs) Well, that lands Autumn Sonata at spot 192 (laughs) on our chart. 192 out of 409, which is about a 53%. It lands. It, it, the last ranking is against Creep Show, Bergman on Creep Show, <laughs> and it loses. <laughs> is that not something just cinematographically wrong? Like, are we, is that a karma? Do we just lose karma points? Pete, you have no place to say that, Mr. <laughs> 2001, straight to the bottom. <laughs> I've already, I've already said my piece. I've made my piece, Andy. I just worry about you making decisions that will impact you the way it's impacted me. <laughs> How'd this do on your I list? I can tell that's really affected you. <laughs> I didn't go to this the last thing I think about every night before I go to bed. And the first thing I think about when I wake up. <laughs> how'd, this, uh, how'd Autumn Sonata do on your list? It, it, weirdly, it didn't do quite as well as it did on ours. Um, I, it landed at 2341 out of 4159, which is about a 44%. But I think that's just because I found it to be interesting, but it's not as rewatchable for me. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think it is from a, a, a performance study the perspective of studying their performances, it's, it's exceptional. It ended up on a, uh, a, a three, let's see, 376 out of 1,092 on my list, which if I go by the algorithm, should be about a three and a half stars. Um, and I was, it, you know, my gut had me at right about three stars on this one. Uh, you know, I, I'm a little bit flexible depending on your math, but um but that's that's kind of where it hits me for that very point. Like, I don't find it that rewatchable if I'm not in the mood to just really pull apart actors doing great things. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, I'm at a three and a half um, without a heart. Uh, it's a three and a half. It's it is an interesting film to study and look at and explore kind of this emotional journey of this pair. But it's not something that I love. So three and a half. No heart. You got it. That's I'm gonna go. I'm gonna do what you do because, as you know, <laughs> okay. 
I live my life to do what Andy does. I love that. Three and a half stars. Except no when it comes to 2001. Except for that. That is the one thing <laughs> that we do differently. <laughs> okay. Uh, Alas. And Prince. And Prince movies. That is another thing mm-hmm. that we do very differently. <laughs> Shut up. Yes. Okay. You can take all of my no- copies of those out of the garbage. <laughs> That's so mean. Why would you end on such a mean note? What are we doing from here? First first of all, we have news because we're taking a little bit of a break. We are, me. yes. Yep. We're entering our, our July hiatus, everybody. We will be gone for the month of July. We will return. We'll have a new episode that will land, should be landing August 1st. That will be the kickoff of our Robin Hood series. <laughs> We're going to have a fun time kind of exploring some of the uh, the films of kind of the bard. The bard? Is he the, the bard? bard? I don't know where. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I don't know why I called him the bard. What's the name for him when you're calling it just like the the, the hood? The, the rapscallion? Robin of the hood. I don't know where I'm going with all of this. Anyway, it's a pretty <laughs> lengthy series that we're doing with Robin Hood, though. I'm moving past it, Pete. We're going. I don't know if I can. I don't know if I can. <laughs> Still in it. <laughs> okay, go ahead. You are. We have, this is a, a hefty series, Pete. We're going to be talking about Robin Hood for nine weeks. <laughs> nine oh, weeks wow. of this story. And really, I think it's exploring why is this character so uh, indelible that people want to keep retelling it other than the fact that it's in public domain, which helps. (laughs) But yeah, just what is it that draws people to uh, to kind of kind of visit and revisit? So we're going to be looking at nine variations of it to see kind of what we pull out of all of it. Almost, almost 100 years of Robin Hood movies. I mean, yeah, that's really crazy. Yep. That is just crazy. I mean, there have been more than 100, because I think the first one was actually uh, 1912. Uh, but we are starting with Douglas Fairbanks as Robin Hood in the 1922 silent version. Can't wait. Can't wait. I will say that even though the regular Thursday Next Real show is going on a break, we do have one more show. The film board is going to be doing uh, yesterday the movie yesterday. Uh, so that'll drop. So you already did it? <laughs> Uh, and so we're going to be uh, that'll drop on July 2nd so that'll be the last show uh, it, dipping into the month of July hibernation for the next reel so uh, there you go And but we will be having some special hiatus episodes right? We will um, it exhausts me to even think about it but we have been we've been rattling around this idea for an awfully long time we are finally doing the epic film board re-ranking of our flick chart list it is an atrocity that list i don't know we may find out it's exactly where it's supposed to be but we're right now going under the uh, assumption that it's an atrocity and all five of us have actually gone through and watched all the movies that we hadn't seen for shows that we missed we are all caught up we're going to jump on the line we're going to live stream it for our uh, patrons uh, and we're going to do it all at once on when are we doing that next it's this saturday yeah, this coming Saturday. We're Day gonna be, after uh, tomorrow. Doing that. Hear this. Yeah. Woof. Yeah, it's going to be uh, yeah, June 29th. Yeah, so that's coming. We're going to keep going with a couple of the Saturday matinee shows. So if you're checking those out over at patreon.com slash the next reel, those are public over at that uh, on that particular show. But that's where you have to go listen to it and uh, grab it. Members get it delivered in their custom RSS audio feed. They can subscribe to check it out. Patreon.com slash the next reel. And we have a, one more bittersweet end that goes into hiatus. Not just the next reel, not just the film board for the month of July, but for the rest of the year, Andy, we're done. Oh. We're done. Marvel Movie Minute. That's right. Yes, our last episode for that for Iron Man is dropping July 1st. Monday, July 1st will be minute 126 of the film, which will be a fun one. Tune in. That is us talking with Alex Robinson from the Star Wars Minute about the uh, first of what would become a very common post credit sequence. It's uh, it's a fun one. If you're not listening this week, you gotta you gotta be checking out Tommy Handsome's uh, guest run. Tommy, as you know, regular listeners, he, he hates 
these kinds of films, he actually made good on his promise to not only watch the film, but think about it hard enough that he kind of likes it and has come up with my favorite running joke of the entire Iron Man franchise. I'm not going to spoil it here, but I can't watch Iron Man and not think of this one joke and that erupts this week. So (laughs) there you go. It erupted today. (laughs) Shh. Oh, yeah. Anyway, everybody, um, if you want to hear more of us, just stay subscribed to this, to the Marvel Movie Minute. We will be dropping hiatus episodes periodically, so just check out for those. Otherwise, we will be back with uh, this show in August. We'll be back with Marvel Movie Minute in uh, in January 2020. Ooh, can't wait. Incredible Hulk. Yep, should be fun. But you can support all of our shows. We love our patrons uh, supporting us. Uh, just head over to thenextreel.com slash Patreon. You can get access to our exclusive members-only weekend show, The Saturday Matinee, which we which will be having some periodic hiatus episodes as well, yeah. right? Yeah, it'll be a little uh, round-robin event. It'll be great. Yeah. Yeah. So check it out, everybody. When the movie ends, our conversation begins. Amazon giveth, Andy. As Amazon doeth. Not really. Yeah, sometimes. Eh, not really. I didn't like Amazon this time, Pete. Let me just come out and say it. Amazon really disappointed me. <gasps> Amazon hurt me when I was a child. <laughs> Amazon. <laughs> Amazon stole my girlfriend. <laughs> right Amazon out of the kitchen. Amazon made my sister. <laughs> flirted with my sister and then made, <laughs> made her diseased. <laughs> Amazon. <laughs> I'm a Prime (laughs) subscriber. (laughs) This is ridiculous treatment. Anyway. (laughs) Uh, So where'd you go? I went to Rotten Tomatoes, Pete. Oh. I never go to Rotten Tomatoes. This is what has (laughs) happened. (laughs) Okay, so what'd you find? Or should I do Amazon and then we'll wash our hands of it? Do Amazon... Okay. We'll see. Maybe I'll. Right. Maybe you'll swing me back. I don't know. Okay, let's see. Uh, this is from. Uh, this is a. <laughs> I there were. I didn't. You know. I didn't want to go for the five stars and the ones and two stars were not good. But I did stumble right into the three stars right in the middle with the uh, review titled "Straight to the Bottle." If you're contemplating suicide but can't summon enough angst to be decisive, watch Autumn Sonata. Ingrid Bergman's last film, and only collaboration with Ingmar. The dialogue and acting are terrific and very, well, real, but I doubt I'll ever recover my former sense of humor, since apparently, one, life is a steaming pile of excrement, two, relationships are tenuous and scarring, and finally, three, nobody really loves anyone. Oh well, (laughs) even bad IB is better than other stuff, so open up your best bottle of red wine, lock up the razor blades, and enjoy. Oh my! Oof. That's a doozy. <laughs> Not only is that a doozy, but five people found that helpful. Helpful in what way? We don't know. Yeah, right. What they did you fare better on the old RT? Well, over at the old RT, what I found is that there are some people who give some very concise, short reviews, and mm-hmm. I love it. So I thought I would just read a few of them. Oh, <laughs> okay. Why Great. not? It's a potpourri. <laughs> First, we have David F., who says, four stars, four out of five, classic, talky, psychological, and theatrical Berkman. Oh. I think that's that's pretty good. There you go. And then we have Sherwin L., who says, four stars, probably not your best choice for a Mother's Day movie. Oh, that's a sarcastic one. I like that one. <laughs> that makes me happy. Yeah, it's, uh, and then then I think I'll end on this one. Ruben S., five stars, I will watch this over and over and over again. Ruben, what hath yeah. what hast thou wrought? I don't know. Hmm. That's a lot of that's a lot a of heart lot of, for Ruben. Yeah, it's too much. Too much. Yeah. Overkill. Dial it back, man. So thanks, Amazon. Mm-hmm.
It is hard to believe that we have been having in-depth weekly conversations about movies since 2011. So many great movies, so many great conversations. But it's a lot of work. Producing this show week after week does require a lot behind the scenes. If you'd like to help support our efforts, one easy way is by using our Originals page when shopping for books and movies that we've covered. Your purchases made through our links give us a small commission at no extra cost to you and allow us to keep having these great discussions. We had some great films in Season 8 that started their lives as books or plays, and you can find all of them on our Originals page at thenextreel.com slash originals. That's the site where listeners can find links to purchase all the source material behind the adapted films we've covered from season one up through our current season. For part of season eight, we had a series celebrating the 50th anniversary of films from 1968. We talked about 2001 and 2010 for our Odyssey series, both adapted from Arthur C. Clarke's novels. Man, the second one was so much better than the first, right? Don't you even get me started. (sighs) Need I bring up Under the Cherry Moon again? Yes, also so much better. (laughs) Wait, wait, no, that's not what I... (sighs) Planet of the Apes kicked off its series based on the novel by Pierre Boulet. We covered Danger Diabolic and The Detective, adapted from novels for our 1968 crime films. Wait, wasn't that The Detective the prequel to Die Hard? They were both written by Roderick Thorpe, and yes, it's the same character in the books. I can't believe they even asked Sinatra if he'd be in Die Hard. That would have been weird. (laughs) Uh, Once Upon a Time in America was part of our Leone Once Upon a Time trilogy, adapted from Harry Gray's novel. And we looked at 1968 Best Picture nominees The Lion in Winter, Rachel Rachel, Romeo and Juliet, and Oliver! We also had an Ingrid Bergman series with adaptations like Spellbound, For Whom the Bell Tolls, Murder on the Orient Express, and Gaslight. We haven't talked about Gaslight. Stop gaslighting me! (laughs) Dive deeper into these books and more adapted films at thenextreel.com slash originals. Every purchase supports the podcast. Get the full list of adaptations that we've covered on all the Next Reel family of podcasts and start your next read today at thenextreel.com slash originals.